So in this video, what we are going to be looking at is something known as phenotypic variation, which is just defined as the differences in the observable features of the organisms. Now, phenotypic variations can be caused by genetic variation, which we have seen in the previous video, and sometimes the environment. Let's see how it plays out. As an example here, we have a situation where this chromosome has a gene for fur color, and the fur color has two alleles, large B, which makes the fur color brown, and small B, which makes the fur color white. So we have three organisms here, three mice, and if you see the genotype of the mice, uh, that is small b, small b, homozygous recessive, large b, small b, heterozygous, and large b, large b, homozygous dominant. So do these mice have genetic variation? Yes, they do have genetic variation because in the previous video, I told you that genetic variation is just the differences in base sequences between the organisms of the same species. Or you can also kind of assume that it's the difference in their genotype. So as long as their genotypes are different, for our level, we can assume that there is genetic variation. Now, when we see the phenotype, the mouse on the left will be white and the two mice in the middle and the right will be brown in color. This is called phenotypic variation because you can see based on observable features, there are some differences between the mice. Yes, you may argue that these two mice are exactly the same, but when you just compare as an overall along the species, there are differences within the same species. So that's what it's called phenotypic variation caused by genetic variation. But sometimes what may also happen is sometimes the environment may also affect the phenotype of the organism. As an example, you can see three mice over here with the genotype of large B, large B, large B, large B, and large B, large B. But depending on the environmental factors such as exposure to UV light, if the mouse is exposed to UV light, the color of the fur might be darker, as you can see here. So even though there is no genetic variation between these three mice, but they have phenotypic variation caused by the environmental factor. So variation in the phenotype or differences in the phenotype can be affected by genetic variation and sometimes the environment. Now, one example of a phenotypic variation you have to know is something known as continuous variation. This is extremely important. The first thing you have to understand about continuous variation is these differences are usually quantitative. What does it mean by quantitative? It means that it is measurable. As an example, height. When you see these two people that I'm drawing on the right side, we can ask the question, who has more height? And what's even better, we can measure it. We can measure that the person on the left is 160 centimeters and the person on the right is 170 centimeters. So that is what is meant as quantitative difference. We can also measure things like skin color. Different, uh, there are many different ways to categorize skin color. This is a chart right here. So when you look at your skin tone, you'll be like, oh, my skin tone might be 4B or my skin tone might be 8D or my skin tone might be um, 1C. You know, there are differences in the skin tone that we can actually measure. We can ask the question, who has a darker skin tone? Who has a lighter skin tone? These things are measurable. And aside from height or skin color, we can also measure things like weight, uh, length of the shoulders. Um, what else can we measure? We can also measure, I don't know. You can also measure things like the strength of the person, like how strong they are if they are deadlifting something in the gym. So that can be measurable based on the weights that they are carrying. Now, another very important thing that you have to understand is in continuous variation, the categories are not so distinct. Now, what this word distinct means is it's not so obvious. Now, 
If you look at those two people, you will tell me that these two people have obvious differences. One is obviously shorter and one is obviously taller. So this means that the categories are distinct. It's very obvious. But if we were to take all the 16 year old students in your school, 16 or 17 years old, to keep it very fair, we will keep their ages constant. So let's, for example, say we took all the 16 year old male students in a particular college or school and we line them up from the shortest to the tallest. We will notice usually that when you line them up, you will see that yes, there is a gradual ascending of the height. So if I were to highlight those two people, is their height obviously different? Not exactly. Yes, you can kind of see that one person is slightly taller than the other if you were to take a ruler. But if you were to look at them side by side, it's not so exactly very different. That is what is meant by the categories are not distinct. The human population is not just split between people who are extremely short and people who are extremely tall. No, there are also people who exist within the extremes as well. There are people who are short, there are people who are average height, there are people who are average tall, and there are people who are tall, and then there are people who are extremely tall as well. So the categories in this case are not so obvious. And a range of phenotypes exist between these two extremes. Like I said earlier, the height of people across the human population can be split into extremely short and extremely tall, but people also exist in, mid in the middle as a range. This is what is meant as the range right here. And of course, last but not least, there are many intermediates. What does it mean by intermediates? In between values. Now, in between values is quite simple. For example, we have a person who's 170 centimeters and we have a person who's 180 centimeters. There can be many different types of height or many intermediates that can be in between that. For example, that can be 175, that can be 176, that can be 172.2. You know, the possibilities are limitless in this case. Between 170 centimeters and 171 centimeters, how many different uh, intermediates are there? In reality, they'll be infinite. But as an example here, you can have 170.1, 170.2, 170.3, 170.4. .3, 170 and in fact, even between 170 and 170.1, there is also 170.05 centimeters. Normally, we ignore these types of, these categories of height and we just round it up to make life easier for ourselves, for ourselves. But that is what is meant by many intermediates. Why then, within this variation, there are so many different phenotypes? For example, humans. Why are there so many different types of different heights in the human species? Why are there so many different skin colors in the human species? Uh, why does it exist as a range? This is where we have to see the genetic basis of continuous variation. You are trying to explain why are there so many different types of phenotype. The first important thing, even though this is not a genetic basis, you can kind of shoehorn this into uh, this particular category. You can say that continuous variation can be affected by the environment. You can see three mice over here, and those three mice have a range in their fur color because it's measurable, it's in a range, and they can also have intermediates. What does it mean by intermediates? As you can see here, between those two mice, you can have a mouse that exists with that fur color. And between these two mice, you can also have a mouse that exists with that fur color. In another case also, this is just my example. Remember, in chapter 16, we talked about the LE gene. And this gene codes for an enzyme to make active gibberellin to affect stem elongation in the plants to make the plants tall. And if the plant is homozygous dominant, what's supposed to happen is the plant is supposed to be tall. But if you notice here, even though this plant is large LE, large LE, it's short. The reason why it's short is because even though it's an adult, it did not get enough light or minerals, so it was not able to elongate its stem to its maximum capacity. So this plant here is short. So even though it has the genetic 
information to make itself tall, it doesn't have the environmental factor like uh, such as light or minerals such as nitrates or such to make it tall. So this is how environment may also affect the phenotype of the organism. In the genetic basis of continuous variation, we must also talk about polygenes. Polygenes cause continuous variation. What exactly does polygenes mean? Poly means many, genes mean genes. Yeah? So many genes on different loci on the chromosomes may also affect the phenotype. Okay, we cannot agree, if you, if you do a quick Google search, we cannot agree how many different genes can affect the human height. But some scientists say that there are about 50 different major genes that may affect the height of a person. 50 different genes, by the way, in our 23 pairs of chromosomes, which may affect our height. And the assumption is, if you're dominant for all these particular genes, your height will be extremely tall. But if you're recessive for all these genes, you'll be extremely short. But 50 different genes are too much to talk about. So let's keep it simple. Let's say I'm drawing out three chromosomes here. And on those three chromosomes, I'm putting gene one in the first chromosome, gene number two on the second chromosome, and gene number three on the third chromosome. And I'm going to say that all these genes affect one phenotype. Please do not memorize my example. This is just um, a way for me to explain this in the exam. But the point I'm trying to say here is gene 1, gene 2, and gene 3 are more than one gene. So we can assume that this is polygenes. Yes, I know 3 is not many, but we can assume that 3 is many in this case. And all these genes affect one phenotype, which is height. So all three genes have an influence in the height of the organism, whether it's going to be tall, medium, or short. And here's the interesting thing. Within gene number one, I'm going to put the alleles A2A1, gene number two, B2B1, and gene number three, C2C1, okay? And the reason why I didn't use large alphabets and small alphabets is I want to imply that this is codominant so that each allele will be expressed. The interesting thing about continuous variation is all the alleles will have a small effect on the phenotype as well. So many genes affect the phenotype and cause continuous variation, and all the alleles within these genes will have a small effect on the phenotype. What do I mean by this? In my example here, I'm saying that if the allele is A2, B2, or C2, it adds two units to the height. Do not memorize this. This is just my example. But if it's A1, B1, and C1, it adds one unit to the height. So you see, each of the alleles will have a small additive effect on the phenotype. The small effect means A2 adds two units of height, but A1 adds only one unit of height. It's not so, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not so significantly different between each other. So as an example, let's take a plant, and this plant has a genotype of A2, A2, B2, B2, C2, C2. So it has the three pairs of chromosomes, and each chromosome has uh, each chromosome has gene 1, gene 2, and gene 3. So it will have two alleles for gene 1, two alleles for gene 2, and two alleles for gene 3. So let's say in my case, it's A2, A2, B2, B2, and C2, C2. So the plant in this case will have two units of height, plus two units of height, plus two, plus two, plus two, plus two from each of the allele, the plant will have 12 units of height. Just as an example, do not memorize this. What if the plant has a genotype of A2A1, B2B1, C2C1? So it's two plus one, plus two, plus one, plus two, plus one, which makes the plant have nine units of height in this case. So there is a difference between these two based on the genotype. And what's the shortest plant that can be produced? The shortest plant that can be produced is A1A1, B1B1, and also C1C1 genotype. The plant will have six units of height. 
and the tallest plant will be A2, A2, B2, B2, and C2, C2. So in this case over here, that plant will have 12 units of height. But here's the thing, because of independent assortment, crossover, random mating, and um, what's the one? Uh, I forgot, uh, random fusion of gametes, uh, the alleles can be slightly different, right? You can have um, A, A2, A1, B2, B1, C2, C1. You can have A2, A1, B1, B1, C2, C1. You can have A2, A2, B1, B1, C2, C2. So there can be many different combinations. So most plants will exist between the 6 units of height and 12 units of height. That is a range of phenotypes. That is why in continuous variation, you can have all these different types of height. And to make even matters even more complicated, let's just take three plants which are genetically identical. A2, A1, B2, B1, C2, C1. Okay, so logically these plants should be nine units of height, which is somewhere in the middle, but this particular plant might be 8.6 units of height. That plant might be 9.4 units of height. How is that possible? That is due to environmental factors. You know, this plant did not get enough sunlight. That plant might have gotten extra sunlight and extra minerals. So it was able to grow slightly more. So that is why continuous variation can give you many different varieties within one phenotype. In this case, height. So when the question asks you about genetic basis of continuous variation, you need to mention that number one, in continuous variation, it can be affected by the environment. Number two, many different genes or polygenes can affect the phenotype of the organism. And number three, different alleles may have a small effect on the phenotype as well. These three factors are the genetic basis of continuous variation.